Good evening. I'm Sandra Peart, Dean of the Jepson School of Leadership Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth and final event in our Jepson Leadership Forum speaker series, Masculinity in a Changing World. I think those of you who've been here for several or, or all of the previous uh, events can agree that it's been a really terrific series. It's been exciting to witness the high level of interest that we've seen. We've received some 2,500 registrations from people who had intended to uh, attend the series either in person or remotely. So I thank those of you who are here with us in person this evening and those of you who are attending via live stream. We're grateful that you, like us, wanted to delve deeper into the subject of masculinity in the context of swift moving cultural change. Earlier today, Jepson student Alifair Cutler and tonight's speaker, Dr. Alice Evans, sat down for a take five video interview that we will later upload to our website. A member of the class of 2024, and a native of Dover, Massachusetts, Alifair is a leadership studies major, minoring in psychology. She conducts research with Jepson School professor Crystal Hoyt on gender and organizational mindsets. She also participates in the Gary L. McDowell Institute Student Fellows Program, which engages students in discussing ideas across ideological, the ideological spectrum, thereby enriching our students' intellectual experience relative to po political, social, and economic ideas. After graduation, Alifair hopes to work in an executive search position before eventually attending graduate school. Please join me in welcoming Alifair to the stage and check our website for updates on the 2024-2025 Jepson Leadership Forum. Welcome. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dean Peart. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's featured speaker, Dr. Alice Evans. Dr. Evans has received her Doctor of Philosophy from London School of Economics and Political Science. She's a visiting fellow at Stanford University and a senior lecturer at in, in International Development at King's College London. In her podcast, Rocking Our Priorities, she interviews academic experts on growth, governance, and gender. Dr. Evans has published extensively on topics ranging from gender, urbanization, the drivers of social change, inequality, and global production networks. In her forthcoming book, The Great Gender Divergence, to be published by Princeton University Press, she will offer a global history of gender. In the book, she will also give an accounting of why, when societies around the world have become more gender equal, some regions have become more equal than others. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alice Evans to the stage. Okay, hi Richmond. It's a real pleasure uh, to join you in this beautiful campus. So, many economists, economists and economic historians have debated what they call the great divergence. That is how the West became rich and democratic. And there are many books on this, you know, how is it that Britain led the Industrial Revolution? And looking at this fantastic literature, I realized we could ask the exact same question about gender. Over the 20th century, our entire world became much more gender equal, but some regions are far more gender equal than others. So this map shows women's share of labor income across the world. It's calculated from female labor force participation and also gender gaps. So if we look at the Middle East, North Africa and South Asia, it is men who go out to their homes to provide for their families, organize politically and make the laws of the land. Now, in East Asia and Russia, women work at very high rates, but are locked out of politics, locked out of the higher levels. Now, Latin America over the past 50 years has seen a massive rise in female labor force participation, activism, representation. It is now converging with Europe. You know, for most of our history, Europe was incredibly patriarchal, far more so than the Gulf of Guinea and Southeast Asia. 
So the question is, what explains this great gender divergence? To me, I think it is one of the biggest questions of humanity that social science has not yet answered. And that is what I'm trying to do. So I said to Princeton University Press, listen, what I want to do is to study the history of every single society in the world. And from all the, you know, putting together all these little bits of data, I'm going to build this massive, massive jigsaw. And I'm going to do it. And so they said, OK, you can try. You can try. So that, that's what I'm, I'm going to try and do. And I may not be totally correct, but I think we should at least try to answer this question. So, um, and yeah, we, and so, so this is what I've been doing. I believe I am the first person in the world to do qualitative research in nine world regions. So the pink flags mark places in which I've done qualitative research. So I've lived in Zambia for 18 months. I'm fluent in Bemba, which is a Bantu language. I've been in Mexico, Morocco, Uzbekistan, across India. I recently returned from Korea and Hong Kong. So I listen to people and through this qualitative, comparative research, and also studying archeology span and history and economics, I can try to assemble this big, big picture about cultural evolution and why we see this big variation. So, very simply, the great gender divergence really emerged in the 20th century. Before then, the whole world was pretty patriarchal. But when you see rapid economic growth and democratization, women generally seize those opportunities. So in the US, women forged into the labor market and organized politically feminist activism. But that is mediated by culture. In some cultures, men's honor depends on female seclusion. So in parts of the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia, even when there are economic opportunities, women generally stay at home. So families forego that income in order to maintain their honor. That is the honor income trade-off. Now, you may be wondering, well, why is it? Why in South Asia is men's honor so dependent on female seclusion? So for that, we need to go back 10,000 years. So now what I want to do in like 28 minutes is to do like a whirlwind tour of history. And I'm going to pick out a couple of examples. And if you have questions and if I've missed out topics, we can discuss this in more detail. OK, OK. So yeah, here's this example. So you see uh, right across the world, we see very high rates of female employment, but total stagnation in South Asia, in the Middle East, and North Africa. So one thing really is important. To, so when we're theorizing patriarchy, what I find is that there was lots of cultural uh, heterogeneity across the world, but large successful empires tended to be more patriarchal. And I think my theory of that is pretty much group selection. So groups would be more successful in conquering and a battle with other groups if they were strong, united, and cohesive. So social cohesion was really, really important for, any to, for a group to expand. Because if a group gets beyond, say, 150 people, and those people don't trust each other, if they are skeptical or jealous of each other, then you have lots of fighting, you have very high homicides, and the group becomes smaller. So you need social cohesion within the group to, in order to have city-states. And the way societies solve that historically, uh, and, and fraternal solidarity is especially important. So some of you came to Carol Hooven's wonderful lecture. And so testosterone has a couple of issues that are important. So men's testosterone tends to be five to 20 times higher than women. So this is associated with violent aggression. Now, if men just have violent aggression, they could just kill each other. So that's not so great for groups, right? But if men are united in solidarity, if you have fraternal solidarity, then those men can be united against another group, right? So you want that fraternal solidarity. So any group that can really buttress this coalition among men is going to do really, really well militarily. So you want this Roman army to be strong and united. Okay. So I think, it, so Charles Darwin had this idea of group selection. That you, that, you know, co uh, conflicts would have favored groups with strong social cooperation that were better at waging war and making women have babies. If you could do all those things, you're on to a win, right? You've got to ramp up the fertility, wage war, and be strong and united with your brothers. And so I like how uh, there's this Urdu saying, the three things that men would fall apart and squabble over were women, wealth, and property. So sexual jealousy could tear men apart. So what did many of the early societies do in order to reduce those squabbles between men? Many of them enshrined ideals of female virginity, chastity, and seclusion. 
And the more that you enforce marital, you know, thou shall not commit adultery, the more that you, you know, push women into the home or tell people not to have affairs, the more you're going to be consolidating fraternal solidarity. If you don't think that your neighbor could be sleeping with your wife, you're more likely to do commerce trade and go to, uh, you know, battle with each other. So I think this is a really important thing, stopping men from being jealous by pushing women into the home. So we see, so, you know, religion can support this in several ways. One is religious rituals. If people sing and chant and pray together, that's consolidating fraternal solidarity. And also, if you're terrified of a big God spiting you and sending you to hell, right? There's a pretty strong, you know, incentive to, to play by the rules, to play by the books. So we generally see that in large states, they have this idea of moralizing supranational punishment, the idea of fearing a big God. And what did all those Abrahamic religions do? They had this big idea that if you, you commit adultery, if you're not chaste, if you're not a virgin, then there will be big punishments. So religion tends to go along with large states. And if these large states have patriarchal religions and they conquer other places, then eventually, you know, many, much of the world can become more patriarchal. <clears throat> oh yes, this is an example of a, a ritual solidifying and strengthening the Muslim Brotherhood, right? The Umrah. So, you know, patriarchal religions um, tended to have all these things. Oh yes, the Okay, so we see, you know, across many of these religions historically, big ideas of female virginity, chastity, etc. Okay, so that's like, you know, these big large empires tended to be more patriarchal. But then we have to still explain how did the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia really come to idealize seclusion? So, the Yamnaya. Yamnaya, very, very important. So you have these bands of brothers that erupted out of the Pontic steppe. And we know from genetic data that they basically slaughtered the indigenous males and reproduced with the, the women. So these very strong united bands of brothers, they go all out. And it's this conquest that causes massive cultural change. How do I know this? Because when I look at the archaeology and stories about societies that preceded the Yamnaya, we see that they were actually sometimes more female friendly. So in what is now Rome and Greece, there were the Etruscans and the Minoans. And their iconography and much of their art shows women mixing and mingling in the public sphere, women having important roles. Minoan art never showed women as mothers. The Gortian Code, which came after the Minoans, gave women equal rights. But then what happened is you had the Mycenaeans, who are more influenced by the Yamnaya culture, conquer and take over the Minoans. So it's conquest that changes culture. Oh yes, these, this is an Etruscan temple. Men are met women mingling. And then of course you have the uh, Athenian women who are veiled, right? Conquest causes cultural change. Ban of brothers coming in. Now the Yamnaya steppe pastoralists also go into what is now Iran and they intermarry with the ancestral North Indians. So that is this more patriarchal force coming into uh, North India. Um, so these are people speaking Indo-Aryan languages, marked in yellow. And then another big step change is under the Gupta dynasty. This is when we see from the genetic data that caste hardens in India. So this is when the uh, Gupta dynasty is really entrenching religious authorities. And they're saying, you know, there are all these Hindu ideals of female seclusion. This is when we see the rise of prepubescent marriage. So people marrying within their jati. And that means more female seclusion. So there is an exact coincidence and correlation between the very, very patriarchal religious Hindu texts and also the genetic data showing that caste is hardening at exactly this period. Um, okay, so that we, put, we, we have to jump very quickly, obviously, because it's doing 10,000 years of history. Okay, so, 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 so now I want to jump back to, to, the, to Mesopotamia. So in the third millennium BC, when I look at the archaeology, these are little uh, figurines that women gave, that elite women gave, representing themselves to the temple in what is now Iraq. And as you can see, they're wearing these rather fetching shoulderless dresses, right? So there is no ideal of female seclusion. Women are representing themselves and say, hey, I'm wearing a shoulderless dress. So now when I look at uh, Sumer as a society, women were officials, women were listed as working in temples, women were scribes, women were listed as heads of households. So even though you have these strong city-states, they seem to be relatively female friendly. Then I see a big step change from second millennium BC in that suddenly women retreat from the public sphere. Even as I look at all the iconography, the archeology, span it's suddenly much harder to see any women in the public sphere. So what happened? 
Well, one possibility is indeed conquest. So the Amorites then went to, uh, they migrated towards Babylon, and then you're building the Babylonian Empire, which could have spread Amorite ideals of female seclusion. So it could be, and I really don't know why people did stuff in second millennium BC, but it's possible that this conquest and this empire spread ideals of female seclusion. Um, but at that time, the Middle East and North Africa had enormous cultural heterogeneity. So the Amazons in what is now northern Turkey by the Baltic, these were women warriors. Now, of course, men uh, generally have much more upper body strength and throw a more powerful punch than women. So it generally have comparative advantage in hunting. But the horse mitigated those biological differences. On horseback, a woman could be just as fast and just as fearsome, especially if she trained a few hounds. So on horseback, right across the Pontic Steppe, we see women celebrated as warriors in the Orgon inscriptions, in all the Turkic ballads, in the Sagras. They all talk about these powerful women, and women had a, a far greater, more gender equal space. So the Amazons, Turkic society seem relatively gender equal. The ancient Egyptians also had far greater status. None of their goddesses are idealizing virginity. Women had far greater freedom. Some of them were priestesses to the cults of goddesses. As you can see, they are not veiled, right? None of them are veiled. They're, you know, fairly visible. Um, this is Queen Zenobia of what is now Syria, who led an army of over 60,000 against the Roman Empire. So we see lots of instances across the Middle East and North Africa of developed complex societies recognizing female freedoms and women's leadership. So it's not, then what, the big step change is the Arab Islamic tribes conquering much of this area to become the Umayyad Caliphate. Now, Local people were taxed with the Jizah head tax if they did not convert to Islam. And over several centuries, people increasingly converted to Islam, adopted an Arab patron. And as a sign of prestige bias, we also see people adopting cousin marriage, which cousin marriage remains especially high in all these regions that have remained Muslim. And so Egypt shifted from tracing descent from both the men and the women to being patrilineal, tracing descent down the male line. Another big step change comes when Baghdad becomes the center of the Abbasid Caliphate. So Baghdad was incredibly, incredibly wealthy. And what we see then is the emergence of what we call the Ulema State Alliance. So the leaders gained authority by entrenching the clerics and the madrasas and the religious authorities who then preached obedience uh, to the rulers. So this is when we see this a religious authoritarianism. Um, starting in Baghdad. And one of the key scholars was Ghazali. So everyone at this time was revering Ghazali. And Ghazali preached that men were uniquely capable of spiritual perfection, men were uniquely capable of reason, and men gained piety by policing women. And like, for example, there is a Moroccan scholar, Ibn Tumert, who was a preacher. He went to study under Ghazali and the House of Wisdom, and he came back to Morocco with these very puritanical ideals. He wanted to close the wine shops. He slapped the Sultan's sister in the face because she was not veiled. And the Moroccan Muslim leaders at that time thought this was outrageous. They chased him from Fez. They, they flogged him in Marrakesh because they, they thought he was too radical. The Muslim leaders didn't like him. What did he do? He escaped to the Atlas Mountains. He built the Al Moa had uh, resistance and they took over Morocco through conquest and they institutionalized a much more patriarchal puritanical regime. So it's again conquest causing cultural change. Um, and the other example of cultural assimilation was the Turkic. The Turkic soldiers trained and worked for the Abbasid Caliphate and then became a lot more uh, patriarchal as they adopted these Ghazali inspired Persian ideologies. Oh, yes. Okay, so that's the Atlas Mountains. Okay, now we're jumping. We're jumping to East Asia. Now, China has had a lot of cultural heterogeneity in its past. So this is a Taoist mural. Um, and under Taoism, women were recognized as spiritual authorities and teachers. But then what happened from the uh, 7th century in the Tang Dynasty under Empress Wu Zetian is that the Chinese imperial state institutionalized these meritocratic civil service exams where any Chinese man could sit these examinations, but he had to study his Confucian texts. Now, Confucianism was much, much more patriarchal. 
So Confucianism really had the idea of the husband being the leader, the husband being the authority, the wife should obey the husband. Now Confucian also had, Confucius also talked about meritocracy. So he thought anyone was capable of being a ruler, anyone was capable of being a ruler as long as they were learned, as long as they understood Confucian virtues. But China from that period became much more patriarchal because this particular ideology was institutionalized through the state exams. And all the men wanted to study those exams because that's how you got social mobility and a very big honorable position. That's how you excelled in China. Okay, so this is a portrait of Kana Fing in, uh, under the Song Dynasty, and it's like only men in the public sphere. So this is when women ideally retreated to the private sphere, and it's in th this period in the Song Dynasty when women started wearing very short little shoes. That's when daughters' feet are being broken and bound, so they're signaling chastity because their feet are like, you know, only a couple of inches or whatever. So you have this reverence for the literati. So the greatest people in China, well, below the royal family, are the literati. There's a real reverence for education in Chinese culture. Re education and meritocracy and the idea of upward mobility. Okay. So all these societies right across Eurasia really idealized female seclusion. Like Eurasia was very, very patriarchal. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump over that. Okay, but, uh, you know, the rest of the world was, you know, had lots of, you know, in Southeast Asia, there were many female leaders. Uh, so the rest of the world was not like that. In these Andean civilizations, where there is a very, very high labor demand through making uh, freeze-dried potatoes, uh, there were fairly weak restrictions on sexuality. When the Spanish conquerors went to Latin America, they condemned what they saw as trial marriage. They said it was diabolical. So the rest of society, especially where you don't see inherited wealth, there was much greater diversity, much greater diversity, especially among people that had not been conquered by those large patriarchal empires. Oh, so this is um, an Andean statue, an idea of gender complementarity, which runs through many Andean cultures. Okay, now sub-Saharan Africa is interesting because there's lots of land abundance and there's little, uh, little land scarcity. So what they really valued was wealth in people. Wealth in people was super, super important. So where you see wealth in people, people, you know, generally they allowed women to move far more freely. And because women were not restricted, they could build what anthropologists call reverse dominance coalition. So collectively, they could defend themselves and push back against men who usurps their rights. So where women have more freedoms, they tend to build these coalitions. Um, oh, and one similarity once, so this is not sub-Saharan Africa, oh, yes, okay. And they also see these reverence, uh, that, so that's a picture of slash and burn agriculture. The idea that you don't have inherited land, you just burn the fields, harvest it for a few years, and then move on. And then you see this big celebration of female fertility. Now, you know, we see these celebrations of female fertility from all over the world, and we have to be careful in how we interpret them. It doesn't necessarily mean female authority. It could just be, a way of making women pump out babies. Like say fertility is the greatest thing in the world and that would encourage women to have more children so that your group becomes larger. So I personally don't know how much this tells us about the average woman's position, status, autonomy in all these societies. It's very difficult. It's difficult to know and so I think with any prehistorical society where we don't have much written evidence, I'll sit on the fence. But we do know, we do know from a lot of our oral histories that especially in the Gulf of Guinea, women could achieve positions of spiritual and political power. So there might be lots of matrilineal succession. In Ghana, for example, the Asante, women could also be gaining positions as oracles, as queen mothers being revered. So women generally had the possibility of more authority. That doesn't mean that we, all women were necessarily free from violence. Like across the Gulf of Guinea, there was a lot of what we call debt peonage. So when labor is really, really valued, people might sell their own family into debt peonage, like indebted labor, indebted labor. Okay, right. Now we need to go to a big, big step change that happened in Europe. So ancient Greece and ancient Rome idealized monogamy. They saw polygamy as totally barbaric. And then with the emergence of Christianity led to a major, really important step change in that they idealized love and the idea that marriage was supposed to be a voluntary conjugal partnership. And from 300 CE to 1300 CE, this was really enforced throughout Western Europe by the Catholic Church. So they banned cousin marriage. 
So what this led to is a massive, massive step change is that couples who are increasingly marrying for love are marrying a nuclear family. Now, if it is a nuclear couple, that each of them, the man and the woman, needs to be earning enough before they can actually marry. So what that led to is a much later age of marriage because you brought to work very hard in order to get enough resources. And it also meant that the couples tended to cooperate together, the two of them, and for women to generally work throughout to the rest of her life. So this led to a massive step change in Europe. So Europe then moved away from ancient Greece and, and Rome, which were much, much more patriarchal. Um, Scandinavia was exceptional within Europe because it had, much like sub-Saharan Africa, terrible, terrible soils, right? Because they're so far up in the Northern Hemisphere, they're only getting five months of sunshine a year. So the agriculture is crap totally crap. So you have a lot of slash and burn, like, uh, like Africa, which means that you don't have that inherited wealth. So back in the 17th century, 90% of uh, the Swedish peasants earned, uh, owned, uh, earned about 70% of labor income. So it's a very egalitarian society without much inherited wealth differentiation, without much of a middle class. So the roots of Scandinavian egalitarianism go right back to crappy, crappy agriculture. Very similar, very similar. You know, the Swedes are very proud of their culture. It comes back right down to crappy agriculture. Well, that's my theory, at least, right? This is the agriculture I was talking about. Okay, right, okay. So now we're speeding on to colonialism. So I'm just going to take one example, but we can talk about any different examples you like. So basically, surplus sons from Spain went in violent, violent conquest to Latin America. So it's male bias migration. It's incredibly violent. We know millions and millions of Native American people uh, died from diseases or were slaughtered. And thereafter, it was a very unequal, pro uh, unequal colonization with lots of harassment and la land seizures and humiliation and degradation of indigenous peoples, uh, except for example here. Um, and I think this may have sowed the seed for weakening social trust and also creating a more violent culture. And I think that, and we'll, we'll return to that later. But I think this process of colonization where you've got a large group of men moving to an area and being very violent and having lots of land inequality alongside very weak state institutions will be important for the present day. And we'll, so hold that thought, we'll come back to it later. Okay, but Europe at this time is very, very patriarchal. So this is a, a painting in one of the Smithsonian museums. It's called Men of Progress. So 95% of the clubs and associations in the English-speaking world were run by men, for men, and women were totally excluded. So Europe and USA were very, very patriarchal. There's a wonderful book you may have read. It's called uh, Women, the American History of an Idea by Lillian Faberman. And it's all about how patriarchal you know, America was like 150 years ago. So there are some really great examples of you know, women bullying women. And, you know, and so in many ways, uh, the U.S. and the West were not so different from the Ottoman Empire in that men ruled the show, right? It's governments, parliaments, judiciary, universities, um, health, religion, all run by men. And it was pretty similar in the Ottoman Empire. So, you know, there wasn't a big gender divergence 150 years ago. I mean, Ottoman women had legal rights. And we know from the court records in Entab, in Bursa, in Istanbul, and Cairo, that women had these legal rights. And they would pursue uh, property claims in courts. They would, you know, barter and trade. I mean, because they idealized seclusion, often an elite woman would send an emissary on her behalf. So they were by no means passive. But generally, you know, women were still certainly active, but men were running the show right across Eurasia. The big step change comes in the 20th century with industrialization. So in Europe, the US, and also East Asia, East Asian women, because remember they, the East Asians favored meritocracy and upward mobility, women went to the cities in the US and China alike. So women seized all those factory jobs. And in, whether it's in New York or New Haven or uh, Seoul, you know, when women go, went to cities, they started to mix, to mingle, to share ideas, to be inspired by each other, to be emboldened by new possibilities, to, you know, increase their freedoms rather than being so controlled by their parents. So it's really this process of urbanization, industrialization, led to a big increase of female freedoms and also women gaining status. So in China, there are these ideas of face, of filial piety, and women gain status in their households by being able to send money back to their families through remittances, gaining status. But this isn't happening in South Asia. So here's a nice randomized control trial in Mumbai. And they give slum dwelling women in Mumbai the option of working in an office. And only a very small minority of those slum dwelling women say yes. So even when they're offering them $300 a month, 
The slum dwelling husbands say no. They don't want their wives to do this work because male honor depends on female seclusion. And it's too shameful and stigmatizing for the women to do that work because it signals that the man is not providing. So these South Asian gender norms are so totally, totally different. And it makes no difference if a woman has children or not. No difference if a woman has children or not because these ideals of seclusion are so high. And another really important thing is what I call the patrilocal trap. So in societies that are endogamous, girls are socialized to marry, to stay put, and to please their in-laws. So divorce is totally prohibited in India. You know, divorce rates are very, very low, below 1%. And if divorce rates are low, that means that women have little option but to endure violence. So this uh, shows the percentage of women who have experienced intimate partner violence, but never told anyone. So women are just habituated into just enduring this violence. And so even if a woman has a job, it doesn't seem to reduce her risk of violence. So work in this context is not that empowering because divorce is so totally prohibited. Because the entire system runs on these caste networks, these networks of fraternal solidarity, of trust, you know, the entire Indian economy runs on cooperation and commerce between these trusted caste networks, and those are consolidated by socially, socializing women to stay put, right? Because if you allowed divorce, then the entire caste system would break down. So caste condemns women to this violence and obedience. And, and it's higher in, in, in southern India for reasons I can discuss later. Okay, how many minutes do we have left? Do I have time for communism? <laughs> yeah, how many minutes do we have? 10, I can do communism. Okay, right, 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 okay, okay, okay. So communist central planners, communist central planners set production targets very high and they set wages low. So farms eagerly recruited workers, including women, because they wanted as many, many workers as possible. Workers were cheap. So you get lots and lots of workers and you know, your workbook was the passport to a better apartment. So communist, uh, communist countries generally have very high female employment. That's true of Eastern Europe, of Russia and China. But, they did not, you know, but this was not really necessary for women's gains because, you know, China and Russia never idealized female seclusion. So there wasn't a big honor income trade off. There wasn't an ideal of seclusion that was keeping women at home. You know, if these countries had had just, you know, liberal economies and economic growth, women would have gone into the labor force anyway. So communism was not necessary for women to go into the workforce. And I think communism actually put women back. If you compare communist and non-communist countries, communist countries tend to be much more sexist. And I suggest that's because totalitarian communism suffocated civil society. It totally suppressed any culture of resistance, and that includes feminist activism. And if you don't have feminist activism, if you don't have women pushing back, challenging these ideas, then the entire society stays much more patriarchal. But there is one exception. There is one place in the world where I believe communism actually advanced gender equality, and that's Central Asia. So, central, so this is a photo of Samarkand in the 1930s where women used to wear the paranji. So I was in Uzbekistan for a month uh, in December last year. You know, I interviewed a 99-year-old woman and she told me that when she grew up, you know, they stayed in the women's quarter of the house and they were not allowed to speak to male guests. They did not leave the house when she was little. So the, these ideas of male honor and female seclusion were so strong that a woman was not supposed to be going outside and seeing other people. But then what happened is the Soviets came in and this was a brutal totalitarian dictatorship, right? And they brutally destroyed religious opposition. They, you know, butchered, butchered people, destroyed many beautiful mosques. And they also institutionalized secular schooling, industrialization, and female employment soared. I mean, many of those were, you know, forced into working in collective farms, but others also, you know, worked in kindergarten schools or as nurses. And so female employment increased, and especially in the nomadic pastoralist regions, which never really idealized female seclusion so much, you have women, you know, excelling in STEM fields, women becoming mathematicians and scientists and gaining all kinds of freedoms that they never had before. So if you look, okay, I've edited this World Bank, map, this World Bank graph, um, but you can see the post-Soviet societies have much, much higher female labor force participation. So the Soviet Union literally smashed, smashed that uh, honor income trade-off and female employment is much higher. And it wouldn't be so high, but for communism. But, but, you know, this is where we've got to look at multiple gender indicators. Even though female employment is higher, they still have zero tolerance of uh, divorce in Uzbekistan. Like the rate is like below 1%. The president doesn't even like it and he's trying to repress it. So a woman ha cannot credibly threaten exit. So you have very strong ideas of obedience. 
So it's totally normal to endure violence and to believe that you absolutely have to be obedient to your husband and the mother-in-law. Okay, now back to Latin America, back to Latin America. So if you remember, they never really idealized female seclusion. So with economic growth, female employment increases. With democratization, we see massive, massive feminist movements right across Latin America. And so women are mobilizing, they're organizing, they're pushing back on restrictions on reproductive freedoms, they're legalizing abortion. And now in Mexico, right now, we see two women contesting for the presidency. That's a massive, ginormous leap converging with the US and Europe. However, oh uh, yes, this is Chileans cel celebrating their constitution. So 11 legislative assemblies across Latin America have gender parity. It's totally, you know, very, very normal to have lots of women in leadership. <clears throat> However, across Latin America, alongside this very low, tr uh, alongside you, know, endemic historical violence, weak states, institutions, and the, and the drugs trade, there is incredibly high violence and organized crime is associated with femicides. So where you have very low trust, very high violence, that means that violence becomes a, an everyday reality for women. Um, and so, you know, Latin America's uh, women's biggest problem is not seclusion or lack of empowerment. Their biggest problems are like childcare and, and male violence, machista violence is what they call it. Uh, this is uh, a photo I took in Mexico where I was uh, for a month last year. And this is a ni uno menos, not one woman less. Not the idea that another woman should die from femicide. So violence is a massive issue there. Oh yeah, this is the homicide rate in Mexico. And so, you know, the, you know, where you have a very violent culture, men need to act as macho, men need to be very, very feared so that no one else messes with them. So you get these more machista men and women may even choose a more machista man as they want someone to protect them. Um, and trust, trust is important across the world. So in societies where you have very low trust, that tends to go hand in hand with violence. Because if you have a strong uh, loyalty to your group, but not to other people, then if you see another woman, then she's kind of fair game. So in all these endogamous societies or like uh, Papua New Guinea, where you see very strong family bonds or local bonds, but not seeing other groups is important, that's when you see very, very high violence in cities. So the West got really lucky. You know, we got lucky in very many ways. One, having high economic growth, also having democratization, also having high state capacity, also having high trust. Because these societies were not patriarchal, but because we had all these other things that were great, those have paved the way for greater gender equality and female freedoms. So, you know, in authority, so this is an index of liberal democracy, red, dark red being very, very authoritarian. In these authoritarian countries, even if women are working, they cannot organize, right? So back in 2017, the Duma decriminalized wife battery, wife beating. So it's not illegal to beat your wife as long as you don't break too many bones. The CCP did the same thing. So in these authoritarian countries, it's very difficult for women to organize their resistance. And also if you have very weak state effectiveness. So again, the, way, the West is lucky in terms of having competent, capable states that can enforce the rule of law. Where I worked in you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, even if you have some law on gender-based violence, that's not going to go enforced. So you have whatever laws on the books, but the government isn't going to help you out. And so that makes it you know, a lot harder for women. So that's the great gender divergence. That is my attempt to hobble together all the different bits of data to try to explain how the world has become more gender equal and why we see this big divergence between regions. And I welcome to all and any questions about the entire human history. So thank you very much. Hi everybody, I'm Jess. Uh, I teach Jess Planning. I teach in the Jepson School. I teach ethics, and um, I'm so glad that you are all here tonight. And I also so appreciate what a wonderful talk, and I love the interdisciplinarity of it. I think that really just captures the scope of Jepson, the kind of energy that we try to bring of just pulling all the disciplines together to inform these important questions. But I'm a philosopher, and so I'm going to start with a thought experiment. Right, yes, I love this. All right, so imagine mm -hmm. that there's a society where... For some like strange mystical reason, like a magical like 
dome is placed over everybody who's in that society mm -hmm. and they fully forget all socialized gender norms and all culture. Uh -huh. And then they just start running their society de novo. Do you think that you would see occupational sorting and gender divisions in labor that would align with sex differences in such a society? If we could just sort of like clean slate our psychologies. So wait, are we, are we having, we, we have clean slate our psychologies, but we've also got an advanced industrial system with different occupations. So that's an interesting question. It's like, are there material conditions that would mean that like some types of material conditions you wouldn't see occupational sorting and some you what or um and what have we take? undergone have we undergone evolution uh we've undergone evolution yeah we all we, we're evolved just as we are now uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you can pick your material conditions you wipe out all gender ideologies and all gender beliefs mm -hmm. are you going to see cultural norms evolve within a couple generations that are going to look like occupational sorting based on sex so going back to this idea of testosterone, right? So if men have five to 20 times the testosterone, mm. they're predisposed to violent aggression and eat any group within your dome yeah. is going to have more success if it can beat up other groups. So if you have a group that has strong fraternal solidarity, they're going to be able to kill a bunch of other people and get them to obey them, right? So I would expect the, frater the united band of brothers to have more group selection success. Because, okay, if you've got a bunch of women, I'm like pretty average height at five foot four, yeah. right? I'm not saying, I'm pretty average. I do not have comparative advantage in violence. Mm. I assure you. Um, and I, 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 I do not have comparative advantage in, in violence, either physically or in terms of my levels of testosterone. Yeah. And neither do effeminate men. So it's, I would suspect that your more violent fraternal solidarity groups would be able to run the show. I don't know how long it would take them, um, but you might have the emergence of strong fraternal solidarity and they may be able to enforce their preferences for dominance. Yeah, so you think that the, the cultural norms will, to some extent at least, supervene on these biological differences. Um, but a lot of what you're saying mm -hmm. is that maybe there is these other like very deep cultural roots which are explaining the great gender diversity. Yes, yes, yes. Do we see that when it comes to migration? So if you take people who come from these places that have the very patriarchal culture still, where the gender divergence is still very sticky, and you move them to a place like Sweden, yes, do they take those cultural practices with them or do they quickly assimilate after a few generations okay so it depends on the type of migrant so canada has very selective migration based on skills and if you're always selecting the most most skilled like you're super super educated people mm. then those may be very similar people all over the world but if you don't select based on skills and you just get a more random sampling then you're more likely to see culture so, for example, in the UK, 74% uh, of, British, of British women work. Um, among Hindu Indians, it's more like 69%. Among first-generation Pakistani and Bangladeshis, it's 39%. 39% mm -hmm. of British Bangladeshi women work. So that's an yeah. enormous, enormous difference. But second generation is much yeah. higher. Yeah. So you do see some cultural assimilation. Also, uh, if we look at gender-based violence, communities that are from more patriarchal societies, even second generation immigrants have higher rates of gender-based violence within Europe. But if people are kind of quickly assimilating, that does indicate that maybe the material conditions are part of what's explaining this gender divergence, right? The, the but, but, well, I don't know if it's entirely material. So for example, um, if a group, so I've interviewed lots of migrants. I was in Toronto for three months last year. And I think a group, when they migrate, they face a choice. So you can think, how am I going to gain status in this society? So if you have a large, so for example, in, uh, in Britain, the Pakistani communities, one in four of them are in poverty. And, you know, if the, woman, if the wife is not working, that again is going to be more likely to reinforce patriarchy, uh, to reinforce poverty. And if those communities are also very religious, it could be that what they're idealizing is paradise. Mm. Like if paradise is the most important thing to that group, then you're not necessarily pursuing status through having an amazing job or through having amazing wealth. Like some societies value economic prosperity more than others. In fact, Americans have become much more materialistic. Mm. There was an, this analysis by the Wall Street Journal last year which talked about americans increasingly valuing money over community family and religion right so these values can vary across the world and they can also change over time so if a group values paradise rather than economic prosperity they may favor that 
Whereas, but I think there are so many different variables. So for example, if Hindu Indians are say a minority in a region, they may decide to culturally assimilate um, so that they can gain status in that society. So there are so many different variables that come into it. It's not just about how many income generating opportunities right. there are, but how much you value that income. So it's not all growth and productivity. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, but, definitely not. Um, definitely not. So one thing I noticed watching your presentation yes. is that it's very much the, your, your analysis or the history it's very much driven by male domination and men's choices. And women don't, it doesn't sound like they have as much agency in explaining why these norms vary or why they emerge in this way. And I wonder about whether or not you think that maybe some of these norms might be more conducive to women's preferences. So I'm thinking of like Louise Perry has this stuff about how like modesty norms or virginity norms might be things that women have an interest in advocating for and that you'll see people where it's like norms of sexual promiscuity, for example, might emerge when women are competing more for male partners. Sure. So that, because it's more dimensions along which women will, will want to be able to compete, right? And so, so she has this hypothesis that yes. like some of these norms might be driven also by female partners. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I don't actually think it's very useful to talk about agency because I think everyone is trying to optimize according to their preferences and opportunities and expectations. Mm -hmm. So there are many ways in which women may reinforce patriarchy or women may comply with patriarchy. So for example, um, in Pakistan where female employment is very low and the mother is depending on her son to provide for her, she may try to weaken that conjugal bond so that her son stays loyal to her. Or she may stop that daughter-in-law from working um, or being too attached to that son because she wants to maintain respect in that society. Or a mother may uh, infibulate her daughter, you know, cut off her daughter's clitoris because she thinks that will enhance her daughter's marital prospects. Or when I'm in Uzbekistan, women may be veiling because that's signaling chastity, which is rewarded in the marriage market. Right. So there are many, many different things that women can do to advance their position within a patriarchal system. So I was in Mexico last year in eight different cities and villages, and married women would shame an unmarried woman. Because an unmarried single woman is a massive, massive single threat, right? If I'm a Mexican woman with a couple of kids, if my husband goes astray, then I'm you know, in a, a difficult situation without a paddle. So I want to ostracize and humiliate and, and shun away that pretty single single woman a pretty single woman is a big threat to me yeah right so I, I i would never deny that women can absolutely comply with enforce shame humiliate other women absolutely so my last question but i won't do that today up. i won't do that today <laughs> so everybody think of your questions while i ask my last one do you think that gender parity mm. in occupations and also in households or in education that that is that that should be a goal that people should always be going for a 50-50 gender parity across all of these different sectors. So should we, can we be, can we look at gender distributions and state distributions and see gender skews and then presume anything immoral has happened from it or that it's an ethical problem? I'm an ethicist and so I'm gonna ask the social side, like, or uh, is it possible that you could have very skewed gender distributions in occupations, educational settings or household labor, for example, and that nothing fishy was going on, that that's morally acceptable on your view? So my pronouns are that I'm a social scientist and that's <laughs> all I do. So I think my job is just to analyze data and try to work out what's going on in the world and to share that. And then it's up to other people based on how they analyze and see things to decide what they want to pursue. So I, I claim no philosophy or activism. I am just a humble, humble person looking at data. But I'm going to have a follow-up on that. Because mm. <laughs> clearly a lot of your presentation was very moralized in talking about... Oh, maybe you read it. The like wrongfulness that. of male violence or patriarchy or like framing it in these ways. And I would say that a lot of your historical examples, the foot binding, mm. I'll, go, I'll go out on a limb. Those are morally bad, right? Like those forms of patriarchy, gender division, mm. I think they offend against our sensibilities. We think like, oh, that kind of gender discrimination is morally wrong. And that's part of the reason why we're interested in the gender divergence, right? Because for moral reasons. But is the gender divergence morally interesting for us because there's something intrinsically problematic about the gender divergence? Or is it because gender divergences are a reliable indicator of rights violations from the like violent men that are controlling everything three generations in after we did the gender bubble or whatever, right? So 
I do feel like you have some implicit moral premises here. You don't want, you don't even get into it. I can't get her to come over. I can't get you to to do the ethics class. All right. Well, I'll follow up later. But I will open it up to questions. <laughs> I have a oh, question. we'll bring a microphone to you if you would like. Uh, oh, here she comes, yes. Lawrence. Come. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Thank you. In the United States, uh, when I was in college, uh, college tended to be masculine. Today, colleges, liberal arts colleges, maybe the University of Richmond, we are going more and more feminine. The best students are feminine. The majority of graduates are feminine. What differences do you see this will make for us in the future? Great question, great question. And can I be so bold? as to be self-promotional. <laughs> okay, so I have a website, a, a blog, ggd.world, and I actually wrote about this two days ago. Um, okay, so uh, that's GGD is in the great gender divergence. So I think that everyone cares about status, and especially men. And economists would say there are two big important kinds of status goods. One of those status goods would be like getting, uh, getting into a great university, uh, like Richmond or having a great job. Another would be beautiful girlfriends. So great education, great jobs, beautiful girlfriends. Um, but, you know, with, ri uh, with rising university enrollment, there becomes greater, greater university competition. And if some men are not able to achieve status, if they're not able to get into those fancy universities and colleges, and they're not able to get these fancy girlfriends, then they can feel frustrated. So um, in the US, unpartnered men tend to be $20,000 a year poorer. They're also much likely to be living with their parents. So it's these economically disadvantaged men falling behind, becoming less attractive to women. So that's one aspect. And we also know that as the US becomes more economically developed and culturally liberal, there's less pressure on women to marry, to have partners and to have children. So I, I have another substack advertising myself. That I have this theory that people marry for one of three reasons. Well, love, money, or respect. So if women are economically dependent, they don't have to marry for money, especially if they don't want kids. If you're not in a socially conservative society, you don't have to marry to get respect. You can be perfectly well respected even if you're single. So you only marry for loving companionship. So men's only attractive offer is like hilarious banter, being witty and jovial. But if men are not able, if men are not witty, if men are not fun, no, serious. I interview women across the US in San Francisco and New Haven and Chicago. Many of them say on these dating apps that men are downright dull. And you know, I'm not joking. I'm not joking, I'm not joking. So uh, last week I was in New York all week and I was on the Upper West Side and I was going to Soul Cycle and all these women, they were, we were all there, you know, cycling away, cycling, sweating away, you know, listening to this, you know, great music. And everyone is laughing and adoring our male instructor. It was very, very funny, very, very witty and catty and judgmental and openly gay, right? Very gay guy. And everyone is adoring him and everyone's worshiping him. All these young women are worshiping him. And many young men would like to be in that same position, but they're not. You know, young women are not sort of adulating and falling over themselves for the average mediocre guy who is not doing so well, who isn't so, you know, advantaged. So as women become more culturally liberal and independent and less demand for men, the mediocre guy faces more of a challenge, right? Oh, man. So, so, the, <laughs> so men str will be struggling to get these status goods of, uh, you know, a great university place and a pretty girlfriend. So absolutely, and that may be associated with the rise of hostile sexism, that even though younger people are much more likely to support gender equality in principle, they may be starting to resent, you know, the idea of feminist gains. And so on social media, people like Andrew Tate become much more popular because they can sell this idea that, you know, women are getting all these handouts and women are being advantaged in all these ways and it's becoming hard for men. Great question. <laughs> Take note, fellas. We're on the banter. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. We're opening it up for more questions. Well, can I ask a related question about one of your subs? You can ask any. Um, why do you think we are seeing more political polarization along lines of gender? Do you think it's related to the education divergence with gender or is the politics running separately? What's the theory there? So across uh, Europe, in many places, especially economically lagging regions, 
men are more likely to vote for right-wing parties. They're also more likely to express skepticism about foreigners and immigration. And I think it could be the same thing. Like men who are struggling to achieve status are much more likely mm. to be susceptible to discourses that blame females and foreigners. Like those are your two big threats. Um, and we also see that in the U.S. In, you know, in places like Appalachia, we see a sort of past patriarchal nostalgia that people wishing for a way things were and blaming women. Do you think that also explains why women are moving more to the left? Okay, so I think that's a separate thing. So <laughs> in the, over the past 50 years in U.S. media, it tends to be becoming increasingly negative. So news corporations tend to like, you know, highlight this terrible thing happening, terrible, terrible mm -hmm. thing. Also, over the 2010s, you see much more attention to gender bias and racial bias. And if women are already more concerned about equality and justice and then self-select into those media echo chambers, which reinforce a progressive narrative, then women then become immersed in an idea that, you know, the world is very unfair. And many Democratic campaigners will reinforce this because as they're campaigning, like, please give us our $100 a month or else, you know, babies are going to be die in the border so you're getting lots and lots of terrible stories and if you're totally immersed in those terrible stories that everything is the worst and impossible then you're going to be much more politicized and become much more progressive and feel under threat by the right hmm. Interesting. all right we have a question right up here so what is the incentive for men to want not to be a patriarchy Ha, ha, great, great. <laughs> um, so I think uh, actually we see, I think a couple of things that can shift things is when women demonstrate their equal competence in socially valued domains, then people come to recognize as women as equally competent. Like if you want your team to be great, then you may come to value great women because they're on your team and they're supporting your team. That can happen. Also, there's a big shift uh, after COVID. So COVID with many areas that had, uh, you know, restrictions on people going to public spaces, more work from home. As white collar men worked from home, many of them spent more time with their kids and actually realized they really enjoyed it, right? <laughs> men finally had the opportunity, you know, in many ways, patriarchy is deeply restrictive for men. That men are expected and idealized as going out into the home, working incredibly long hours, and they miss out on all that loving, wonderful time with their children. You know, they don't get this amazing perk of spending time with their children because they've had to work so damn hard. So what happened during COVID is many white collar men spent more time at home and really, really enjoyed it. And um, there's this fascinating research uh, using MRI scans with fathers. And they find that fathers are, uh, that upon fatherhood, men's brains change such that they emotionally bond with their children. And this actually happened to a great, they had two samples, one in California and one in Spain. And they find that a greater cognitive shift happened in Spain. And they think that's because in Spain, men are entitled to two weeks paternity leave. So they had more time to bond with their babies and forge these links. And then economists did a, a follow-up study like uh, 12 years down the line. And they find that children whose fathers who just made that grade to become eligible, those children were much more gender equal because their fathers had bonded with them, spent more time doing their childcare, and those children were less likely to endorse gender norms, they were much more likely to support gender equality, and do much more childcare at home. So all of these things are malleable. There are so many things in play. Um, so yeah, there's lots of potential for malleability. They can, uh, and we also can you know, forge solid uh, alliances within the home. So there's this fascinating study um, looking at congressmen um, interrupting Janet Yellen in her congressional hearing. And they find that fathers of daughters interrupt to Janet Yellen less. So the idea is if you really care about your daughter and you want her to have the absolute best in the world, then you come to empathize with her and you understand her constraints. And you, you know, as a man, you act in a more female friendly way. Saying, it's great. Um, we have a question right here. Can I get a So I have a futuristic question. Okay. So historically, yes, men have more testosterone and generally are more violent on and on, right? So for reasons. But historically, that was an advantage because you could win the war physically. You could throw the spear further. You could shoot the gun better. Mm. Not too distant in the future, we're going to be an intellectual society ruled by computers and robots, right? Who the physical characteristic is going to be much less to the dominance and the brain is going to be much more to the dominance. Meaning a smarter person can do better whether they're physically strong or not mm -hmm. because we're running in a world that no longer matters that you can throw the spear further. 
Yes. So what effect do you think that will have on the situation? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so I think two things. One is definitely, we already see this already, that with technological shifts, women increasingly moved into technological sectors favoring skills at a higher rate than men did. And that may explain part of why women get, come to universities more than men. So absolutely, that's already happening. Um, and that actually closed the gender pay gap. But there are other aspects of testosterone. And obviously, the testosterone is a murky field. You know, it's not exactly clear what its effects are. But one possibility is that it can make men more competitive and more likely to compete for those high status, high status jobs. So if men are more likely to seize those, to pursue those high status jobs, then all else equal, they might be more likely to get those high status jobs. Um, that said, you know, in, in many Western countries, we've built up institutions to enforce norms of parity, to enforce transparency and, you know, reduce discrimination. But it's certainly possible that if there is an association with testosterone and status seeking, um, that men might, that, that, that may still uh, consolidate an advantage. But testosterone isn't the only possible explanation. It could be that people are so accustomed or so internalizing these ideals of status, they feel very uncomfortable when a woman is too uppity and tries to get status. So that's why I need to pretend to be very nice. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, I think we have time for one question. Then I'm going to ask it then. Birth control. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, and the great gender divergence. Yes. We talked a lot about hormones and hormonal differences. Yeah, yeah. But that's one that seems like an innovation that really is changing the landscape of incentives. And so would you expect just having like more reproductive freedom and more reproductive choice as that becomes more available worldwide? What is your hypothesis in thinking about how that's going to continue to sort of change the game? Or how has that moved the great gender divergence so far? Like, what's been the effect of contraception here? So I think in societies that do not idealize female seclusion, when women mm. could control their fertility, when they could have fewer children, then they're able, more able to seize labor market opportunities. Mm -hmm. Right? So in the U.S., in Latin America, women have fewer kids, they can work longer hours. Right. But that's not the case in India. So India now has achieved like below replacement fertility, but women are still staying in their homes yeah. because of seclusion. In South Korea, they now have incredibly low fertility, but they still have pretty strong ideas of male dominance. And in reaction to Me Too feminist organizing, there has been massive patriarchal backlash. Yeah. So, so the, you know, fertility, this, so the effects of fertility are definitely mediated by culture. And on top of that, even if you have the technological advances, some cultures really do not like family planning. Right. So in Pakistan, for example, only 20% of people support family planning. In Uzbekistan, you know, many women I spoke to did not have authority over their bodies. I suppose I'm asking because it looks like as there's been more access to birth control across the world, mm -hmm. all of these places, women as that becomes more normalized, they actually are now seemingly reporting that their realized fertility is lower than their fertility preferences. And so I'm wondering like, what's happening there. But uh, so in Central Africa, mm. you see that people's realized fertility is higher than their fertility preferences because they lack access to contraception. And so like, I wonder if we see that people have higher fertility preferences, what's happening with like, now they have access to contraception. Why aren't they realizing their fertility preferences all the same? What's going on? Well, one, I think we need to be slightly careful about how we interpret fertility preferences. Mm. So it could be that people just normalize this idea that the perfect American family is like two shows, sure. whatever. Yeah. Um, but then on top of that, you know, going back to what we were talking about, the very intensive competition for top university places, in places that are more unequal, where we see more competition, we see very intensive parenting. The mm. parents, in micro, parents micromanage <laughs> their children's um, timetables. So, you know, your kid goes to the math tutor. Your kid, you know, is optimized for this and optimized for that and optimized for all these different things. And that makes parenting very, very expensive and very, very exhausting. And like I've interviewed women in Hong Kong being like, you know, we're in Hong Kong, you have to make a video of your child to get into kindergarten to show that they're sociable to show that all oh these God, other things matter and if parents <laughs> and like in, in korea these kids are going to these private schools hag ones until 10 p.m at night so if you're putting so much mental energy into parenting to optimize your children's chance of getting into top university 
then it becomes so exhausting. And you know, the one outlier is France. So in France, it is really seen as the state's responsibility to school children to create perfect model French citizens. And really mothers don't see it as their job. Like they're fine <laughs> with being a crap mother, like the school will do it. And France has maintained a high level of fertility. Women are working long grass. They don't do so much childcare. It's like, you know, I can be a bit more hands-free. Yeah. I don't need to kill myself. Um, but in other societies where you see this inequality and in intensive parenting, then it's like, I, I think I'll stop at one. But yeah, I love that answer, right? Take note. You can learn from France here. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.